Good evening. So last year, I'm, I want to talk to you today about the way technology and all of us are transforming government. Um, but first, I want to talk about waiting outside in the cold for the bus. So last year, my team and I at Code for America were fellows with working with the city of Detroit. And I don't drive, so this meant a lot of commuting. And you know, as you know in Detroit, uh, we're in Michigan, it's cold here half the year, and the other half it's rainy. It's cloudy, it's overcast, right now it's getting dark at 4.30. And in Detroit, thousands of people every day are relying on the bus system to get around. They're going to and from home, they're going to work, they're going to school, because in Detroit, high school students take the public buses. So, in a city that has a lot of troubles, in a city that has financial problems, the service is not fantastic. And so when a bus comes at all, you don't know when it's gonna come, and even if it is perfectly on time, who really has the whole schedule memorized? So, as fellows, we knew that we couldn't solve this problem, and technology doesn't solve problems in this way, but we knew that we could make a really big difference. And so, we decided to tackle that. Fortunately for us, the city had gotten a federal grant to put awesome GPS trackers in all the bus, buses, which was fantastic, right? Well, actually, this is what it looked like. A couple people in the city hall had access to this information. It's an archaic system, it's impossible to read, and even if you could get it out, normal citizens wouldn't know what to do with it. So, we decided to look at how other cities were doing this. And in a lot of cities, there are fantastic systems. You can call or text or somehow communicate with the government to figure out when the buses are coming. So we're like, let's build a text messaging system to make it happen. And this is a sign I found in Phoenix, Arizona. And you can see, I think this illustrates one of the issues we have when government builds technology anytime. So it has lots of steps, it has options you need to make, it has num a bunch of different numbers on there, it has codes, it has all this nonsense that you really don't care about. And it's mounted up on a pole. I'm not the shortest person myself, but I still had to crane my neck to see what's going on. You know, unless you're a robot, and there's very few of us robots out there, except for one of my colleagues, you're not going to be able to handle this. So we decided let's keep it simple. And we were able to work, work with the city to clear through the clutter. So we made one phone number. You just text in to 50464. You send in your location, and you do it in a human way. You say, here's my intersection. Here's the street addresses that I'm at. Here's the uh, business I'm at. And it tells you when the next bus is gonna come. No mo robot codes, no crazy maps, really simple and easy to use. And I'm really excited to say that we've served way more than a million people at this, or sorry, a million messages at this point. And we're excited to see this working. And the way it worked is because we were working in cooperation with the city to make a difference. And that's what I think is the most important thing. We're in an era where technology is improving sharing for everyone, but so often that's not connected to our government. And there's a worldwide movement to change that. Code for America is one of the anchors of that. They have fantastic programs that do that, but all of us are civic hackers. No matter whether we have a technology background, a policy background, a social background, a medical background, or we just love building things. So that's what we really want to do. We want to transform government we want to transform it into something that is simple, it's beautiful, and easy to use, just the way that the devices and the consumer devices in our pockets are, and we really think that's possible. It's possible by building local networks of people who contribute to this effort. It's possible by building out technology that everybody can reuse. It's by thinking about humans and design from the very beginning, and we think these are the efforts that are really going to make a difference. So, Let's talk about some of the ways this is happening. We all know and really love Wikipedia. It's become the go-to source for so many things. It's a credible source now. We all know when it wasn't, and it's come so far. But there's still a bit of a problem, which is that in becoming such a fantastic resource, they've necessarily had to exclude some information, the things that really might matter the most to us in our local environment. That's things like, what's an awesome business down the street? That's personal stories of the city. Things that might not be verifiable, that probably have never been in a book, they've never been in a newspaper article, they're not in a citable source. There's something that you personally know, love, and feel, and connect with, but have a hard time proving to the world. And fortunately, there's a lot on some awesome platforms to solve that problem. One of them I'd love to talk about is called LocalWiki. And it's the world's, uh, it's an effort to collect and open and share the world's collective knowledge. 
It's a fantastic system, and it means that when you have descriptions of places that could never fit anywhere else, you have a place to put those. It's openly editable, you can download it, you can run it, you can create one for your city and add information that matters and fill this void where there's this very local things that make a difference. So we started one of them in Ann Arbor about in 2005. Since then, it's gotten over 11,000 pages from contributors from across the city and across the country and it's become a fantastic resource. This is one of my favorite pages. It describes the social history of donuts in Ann Arbor. Who knew you could write a thousand words about donuts? It's complete with maps. It has news clippings. It has historical photos. It has the whole nine yards. But so much more of it is a community resource. This is a park near where I lived in Ann Arbor. And for years, it's been an abandoned site. And every time you walk by it, you ask, why is this still abandoned? It's been almost a decade now that this brownfield has sat here. And ArborWiki has an awesome page that describes the whole history of it, from the failed development projects to the onset um, of the mortgage crisis and the failure to find financing through the years. So it means that you can understand what's going on here and you can write the next chapter of it. So whenever something changes, some industrious citizen, one of a couple who really live in this area and care about it, go to this page and contribute to it. They click the edit button and they make a change. It's part of a movement. There are local wikis around the world. It's software that you can bring to any city very easily. And in fact, we just started one for the city of Detroit recently that in the past couple of years already has over a thousand pages. All of these tools, all of these sites are building our shared understanding of the world. And I think another shared understanding that we often tend to forget about are maps. So in the same way that the watch, the wristwatch, in the same way that the clock and the calendar structured human life and transformed the way that we live, having a map, an accurate map of the world accessible to us at all times is really transforming the way we understand place. And now that all of us have us in this, our pocket, it's making us navigate the world in a different way. And it turns out that there's a Wikipedia of maps as well. It's called OpenStreetMap. Um, and this map here was made by a million volunteers. It has more than 20 million miles of roads on it. It's more than 75 million buildings worldwide. And a thousand new editors are contributing every day. And what I think is most fantastic about this project is that the data is truly open. And it's not just open so that you can download it or I can download it. It's open in every sense of the world, word. So that companies have a fantastic incentive to contribute back to it. And if you use apps like Foursquare or Uber, if you read the Financial Times or the Chicago Tribune, if you use Apple Maps or any number of other mapping platforms out there, they've probably incorporated maps from OpenStreetMap into their process. And that's a shift in the way we consider open. It's a shift in what we build out and the way we share information to make it so it's not only for the public good, but that public good can be expanded so much further. It's really easy to edit. You can edit it today. You can go to openstreetmap.org. If you see a problem, you can solve that problem and see it uh, appear in the live map within minutes. And it's a really fantastic resource. But the question is, how do a million editors, how do tens of millions of roads really affect us on a local level? And that's what I want to talk about next. When we were in Detroit, our team was meeting with dozens of community organizations who wanted to transform their neighborhoods. And one of them we met with gave us this file box, bow wrapped, wrapped tied. Um, and this is what was inside it. They had spent months and months with volunteers out on the street recording the information about every house in the neighborhood because they knew to make change in the neighborhood, they needed to know uh, where the vacant and abandoned houses were. They needed to know where blight were, was. They needed to know where fires were being set. And they needed to know where fantastic properties were and the best neighbors were. So they spent all this effort collecting this information. And this is happening inside of cities and it's happening outside of cities. Inside the city, they might not even have this fantastic information. And if they do, in either side, it's probably sitting, if not on paper like this, in a spreadsheet on somebody's desk, on somebody's desktop. It's on one desktop or another. So we decided we wanted to transform this process. And that's another thing we tackled. And when I say we, I don't mean just technologists. I mean everybody in the process from the ground up. 
This was the organizers who are going out into the field and collecting this information. These are the nonprofit and civic leaders who are using it to actually make a decision where they live. It's the people who have design expertise and know how to make tools that humans, everyday people, can use with great effect. And, of course, it's technologists, it's designers, it's coders, and all the infrastructure that's behind a system like this can come together into a wonderful project. So we built out local data. We built out for these organizers an online dashboard where they can manage their data, mobile data collection toolkits, uh, and systems so that they own the information. And I think that's what's key here. Giving people the access to the information is a step, but making sure that they feel ownership over it, that people understand the difference that they can make with the information, and that they're able to use it and understand it whenever they want is the key. We learned some important things along the way. For example, uh, how many people actually do have access to these devices and where access is more constrained, how people working together can really produce fantastic results. We went out in the field with organizers of all ages and ability levels and paired them up together to make sure that we got fantastic local information about the neighborhoods, but then also great ways of entering it and people engaging on these devices and wanting to come back again the next day and the next day to keep working on it, to make it as fun and as simple as sending a tweet. So see, these are some of the projects that have really transformed the landscape of civic information and are changing the way that governments consider this information. It's really easy to bring this project to a city near you. All you need is some friends, a location, and an email out. It's that simple. At Code for America, we like to say that uh, government is what we do together that we can't do alone. And I'm excited to work with everybody here to make this happen in Kalamazoo and across Michigan. So thank you.